office. I have uh, finished laying drywall and uh, laying drywall, uh, putting up drywall, laying bricks, painting, etc., etc. So here's the office. Hopefully, that means more videos will be made more routinely. Um, the the impetus for this video is my e colleague Jason Durf, who recently wrote an article for the Huffington Post where he writes called The Role of Poetry and Religious Knowledge. And uh, the essential uh, kind of thesis of his uh, short article, and I'll link to it on theimageoffish.com, is that um, we ought not use science to try and describe um, religious experience. And when theology attempts to be um, a proof of something, you know, too scientific or logical of a thing, it's, it's, getting, it's getting its subject and content wrong, and instead we ought to consider, um, you know, addressing the, the religious um, in a poetic way or a theopoetic way. And Jason and I uh, have known each other for um, some time online and share uh, lots of vocabulary regarding the theopoetic uh, investigation or exploration of the divine. And so that was familiar to me. But what was really interesting was the comments section there. The, the first is a, a, a quote that someone put in the comments section uh, by Thomas Paine. And it says, the study of theology as it stands in Christian churches is the study of nothing. It is founded on nothing and it rests on nothing. It proceeds by no authorities and has no data. It can demonstrate nothing and admits no conclusion. Um, and the person then says, theology is the study of gods. The difficulty is there's no evidence to study. The whole thing is a humanly manufactured fantasy requiring faith. And I wonder about that, and I think that that kind of, there's nothing there there is one point I want to address, so we'll kind of attack that and hold on to it. There's nothing there there. That's one thought that has come up. And the other one um, is, uh, he's quoting Jason Durr, and he says, Poetry and metaphor are important as ways of doing theology. In a world so divided by absolute claims, using metaphor and poetry allows us to have room for flex. And the commenter says, so you're saying that allowing yourself room for total BS and expecting someone to take that BS for sound knowledge based on the room for flexibility will allow you to perpetuate all the earlier BS that people like you now spend their lives in apologetics for? Good point. So those are the two ideas I think that are important or, or could be important to address. One is the fear or the idea that there's nothing there there and the related commentary that there's um, kind of some ridicule um, for ambiguity or numinousness and that unless everything is clear and defined in a very firm way um, it's not worth doing. And I think that it's important as people of faith to address these two ideas um, because I think they live in, in the hearts of even people of faith. I, I can certainly admit to that. Um, so, we have often addressed, you know, uh, or kind of in varying emergent Christian conversations and progressive Christians in general, and, and not just progressive Christians, but folks for, for hundreds of years, the, the role of doubt um, in, in the life of faith. And I think that there are shades of doubt then. So, I'm not just saying, um, you know, I, oh, I wonder, God, why have you forsaken me? But also doubt in the sense of, of ridicule, you know, that, you know, you know, this second commenter, you know, oh, it's all BS and people like you are just doing this apologetics. And I think there are certain times and even a person who identifies um, as a person of faith when there's a low lull, the kind of dark night of the soul, when we just go, man, what, my life is BS. What the heck? And uh, so it's important, I think, for us to address the perspectives that um, rise to comments like this just for ourselves to explore nuances there and also because people, if we're in a position of leadership, either lay or ordained, people, I think, carry some of these ideas and are certainly exposed to them in the very least. And so, um, you know, the question, I think, that's worth chewing over is, um, do we believe or know that um, experience of God or um, of, of some kind of divine presence, uh, for sure. 
I think that's a really worthwhile question because it leads us to language that may be useful for us to articulate to ourselves, um, to other people of faith of different traditions, and potentially among folks that would ridicule us. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know as if proof or certainty is part of the thing we're doing. Um, I certainly don't think proof and certainty via science is part of the thing we're doing. And I don't think it's that ridiculous um, to, cons to say that. And I don't think that makes me um, insane. Now, of course, I'm biased because I am me. Uh, but the, the turning point there is to say, do we really believe that everything in this world around us is measurable and quantifiable and provable? And, you know, some people go into the area of, you know, quantum physics and say, you know, there's this uncertainty. And I hear that. I, I get that. I think there's some bad science that happens sometimes when progressive Christians try to kind of uh, employ quantum physics. But I, I get the idea. It's a, it's a good notion. I, I would want to go to a more um, kind of everyday kind of thing, which is a love and emotion. You know, yes, there are centers in my brain that trigger compassion and love. And we know we can see the chemicals happening. There's things up there. But, but I don't quite know how to measure or articulate love. Do I love you seven out of 10, seven and a half on a good day? You know, what is that like? How do I show that? What about my father or my grandfather or all sorts of generations of men from different areas that show love in a very different way? Or what about different cultures today that love in different ways? Who are we to define what love is and how human beings interact with one another? How do you prove that? How do you know that certainly? Right? So we don't need to go to quantum physics to get into the realm of the unknown, unmeasurable, unscientific. It's a very day-to-day -day thing that parents love their children and sometimes show it in different ways. How do you know someone loves you? Well, you don't. But you know what? I feel like I need to live in a way that uh, I can demonstrate my love some ways. And some people can demonstrate their love some ways. And we live in communities with one another where we attempt to articulate the connection we have, the community we build, and the solidarity we attempt to have with folks in the world that um, are, are the least of these, those that are on the margins. So I don't need to go to particle physics or quantum mechanics to really start thinking about how uncertainty and unprovability is actually part of the human experience, part and parcel of it. It's bound up in what it is to be human. So from there, it's not that big of a leap for me to go to say, you know what, this experience that I have that I identify as divine is also unknowable. It's unprovable. But it's also part of my life and, from my perspective, also bound up pretty tightly with the human experience. Um, can I know it? Can I prove it? Am I certain of it? No, I'm absolutely not. But in the interim of my unknowing and exploration of that uh, numinous unknowing, it seems to be serving me pretty well to give me a sense of grounding, give me a sense of identity, give me a sense of uh, eschatology and hope for something more. And it helps guide me towards an ethic that I think is sometimes hard to be guided towards in terms of equanimity and, and work towards people um, without it. Is religion just about ethics? Certainly not. It's about aesthetics and experience and community and tradition and um, you know any number of other things I'm leaving out. But there's a number of reasons, and none of them, for me, is about proof and certainty and safety. Um, I think that art and faith challenges us to to be new in the world, to find those new things that are being created. And those new things that are being created um, are not always provable or safe. Um, and I think we owe it to ourselves and to uh, each other to, to explore those things and to maybe acknowledge that proof is not what we're seeking and acknowledge that certainty is not um, a fundamental necessity of human life. Um, Marshall McLuhan once said that the explorer is always inconsistent. If the explorer wanted to be consistent, they'd never leave home. Um, so, here's to having a home that is warm and safe and often leaving it for unknown shores. <laughs>